here, uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Ed Wilds. Thank you, Charles, as ever. So, my name's Ed. I have three uh, half-time jobs, which uh, gets challenging at times. So, I'm a uh, clinical lecturer in neurology at UCL and Queen's Square, which means I'm a Huntington's <coughs> disease researcher. I am a specialist registrar in neurology, so I'm a clinical neurologist, and I also co-founded HD Buzz. Uh, and this is the first room I've ever been in where nobody put up their hand when someone said, hands up if you haven't seen HD Buzz. So uh, you guys rock. I'm really glad that you're using it, or at least too lazy to put your hands up. Either way, <laughs> I'm happy. Mm, maybe that's a bit better. Um, so uh, I needn't go on and on and on and on about HD, but I will mention it briefly. Normally this has two hands, each with five fingers, because uh, I usually talk for about 45 minutes, so in, in, I've chopped off two fingers. I like to talk about five big reasons why families with HD have reason to be hopeful that as a community and as a global <laughs> collective, we can make significant progress towards coming up with effective treatments to slow down or even prevent Huntington's disease. And then I usually talk about the five top specific things that I'm particularly excited about. Today I'm going to talk about the five big things, but only three of the specifics. But at HD Buzz, you will find dozens of specifics. Uh, you guys already have, obviously, and I would encourage you to um, encourage the people that you come into contact with to do likewise. I will be leaving a big stack of HD Buzz flyers, um, probably on this table here, uh, or maybe on the bar. So help yourself to a handful and feel free to give them out. So this is something that I hear a lot. Um, it comes through uh, in talking to family members, I see it on message boards the whole time. And there are several words, this is something that HD family members say a lot of, and it's perfectly understandable, and this is not intended as a criticism. It contains the word hope, of which more in a moment. But the, the crucial word here is the, the word they. Um, you know, the, the idea that the research is something that is done by scientists who are completely separate from family members. And I think that's a really important perception that we need to try and change, because if anyone cures HD, it's going to be us, by which I mean everybody. Scientists can't do it on their own any more than patients and family members can do it on their own. Um, the other thing is that something people often say is that I hope they find a cure for Huntington's disease. Cures are not found, they are made, they are developed, they are invented, and that <laughs> process of invention is also something that we will do rather than they doing it. So I often talk about the mountain of Huntington's disease. This is the task that faces us as a community, the, the need to get to the top of this mountain. And we have this slight problem that we don't quite know how tall the mountain is. But one thing I do know is that if you were to wake up in the morning and decide to climb that mountain without any preparation or without knowing the route to the top, um, you would be likely to fail. Instead, I would suggest it would be better to break the journey down into a number of small steps so that you can make small bits of progress, you know you're making them, and if you have a setback, you only go down one step rather than sliding off the mountain altogether. There are also many different staircases to the top of this particular mountain, although there is no funicular railway. Um, so this is where I, where I like to introduce the idea of substantive hope. Hope has been around for a long time and has never left the HD community, but there is a, a degree of hope fatigue which I experience, which is why where family members get sick of people like me talking about hope, this vague, nebulous idea. Instead, I like to, people to break down the hope into little, manageable, bite-sized chunks of hope, each one substantive. So instead of hoping for a cure, you hope for a gene silencing trial in humans in, by the end of 2014, for instance. And that is what the purpose of HD Buzz is. It is to supply, in pre-packaged form, these little nuggets of substantive hope which I hope will be accessible and useful to everyone who needs them. I'm guessing you guys are aware of our coordinates. In case you are not aware, we're, also on, we're on Twitter and Facebook, and increasingly we post YouTube videos of the sessions like this that we do on stage. Um, I'm the English one, and Jeff's the good-looking one, in case you're ever struggling to distinguish <laughs> between us. So, the five big reasons to have hope. Number one, and this is a controversial statement. Some people agree with this. Uh, people who have completely opposite opinions about the word cure 
sometimes disagree with this statement too, but it, I, Jeff says it's okay, so I'm going to say it. Huntington's is the most curable, incurable brain disorder. So no one would disagree that it's incurable, but then so is the common cold, and people aren't expected to say, I have an incurable nose disorder. This is a question of perspective. Right now we can't take away the burden of HD completely. What we can realistically aim for is to make it into a manageable disorder within a generation. The reason I say it's the most curable incurable brain disorder is that unlike Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, we know, thanks to the work that lots of people have put in, exactly what causes every single case of Huntington's disease, um, which is like knowing where the mountain is. In Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, there are a hundred mountains and there's, there's only a pot of gold at the top of one of them, perhaps. We don't know which mountain. At least in HD, we know where the mountain is. We know we're on the right mountain, and we know when we're going up, and we know when we're going down. And that's because we know the gene that causes HD. Everyone who has the same basic genetic mutation will get Huntington's disease unless we do something about it. Everyone with HD has the same basic genetic mutation, and that gives us a very solid target to work on. It means that anything that we discover from patients or mice or fruit flies or worms or yeast or pigs, we can directly relate to the Huntington's disease gene, the known cause of all problems in Huntington's disease. If it's not connected to that gene, we know we shouldn't be studying it. We can move on and study something else. That's a massive advantage and one that has already produced huge progress in the past 20 years since the gene was discovered. Number two is the global HD community. This is a massive asset. This is a, a truly unique, truly global community. And the community consists not only of patients and their families and those at risk, but also professionals, physicians, allied health professionals, carers, but also um, scientists, basic science researchers. HD meetings are unique. The Euro HD meeting that Asun mentioned, completely unique in terms of having basically almost equal amounts of scientists and family members there. Same for the World Congress. They're, it's a really patient and community driven, um, I'm going to have to say the word community again, community, um, which represents a unique alliance of professionals and um, amateurs, you might, you might say. So the network, <coughs> like the EuroHD network, and in the US, this, this is the meeting Charles and I were at, the Huntington Study Group, um, represent unique coalitions of patients and family members. HDO, make no mistake, represents nothing less than an entire generation of people impacted by something which has flawed every previous generation, taking a stand and refusing to be cowed and refusing to bow before this uh, genetic destiny, standing together and fighting in a way that no generation has previously. Um, it's, it's a really unique and powerful force. And CHDI, I'm guessing some or most of you have heard of CHDI, but um, it's a CHDI is an American non-profit drug company with one target, Huntington's disease, which spends more money on Huntington's disease research every year than the British government spends on lung cancer research. So it is a huge force, and it's not just money. They, they organise, they, they uh, direct research, they directly commission research, and CHDI has already made huge inroads into this problem, and I think is likely to be um, the entity which will be the most significant driver behind the progress which we hope to see in the next few years. Yeah, this is the old presentation, guys. This isn't the updated one I gave you. Um, let me try and remember number three while we're changing the presentation. Um, so, number three is something I like to call the golden window of opportunity. Hey, there we go. Oh, this is the slide I added on the train this morning, which is why I've caused these guys so much in the way of headaches. Today at 4 p.m. is the opening of the Leonard Wolfson Experimental Neurology Centre in Queen's Square, the first experimental neurology facility in Europe, designed specifically with new patients with neurodegenerative disease in mind, to be a home <coughs> where in London where people can come and have cutting edge neurotherapeutics delivered into their central nervous system. So the treatments that I'm talking about later on, the, this facility, 20 million pound endowment by the Wolfson Foundation. Will was designed to deliver, and the HD research team was at the heart of designing it and getting funding, and I'm going to the opening today. So this is a pretty cool day. Um, hopefully other centres will, will crop up with a similar 
theme, but I think it represents how far we've come in terms of how mature our research um, endeavours are. And Britain, which I'm representing here with this incredibly tacky uh, <laughs> ornament, Britain has always been on the cutting edge of neuroscience research. We have the UK HD network. We are crucial players in the Euro HD network. We work together extremely effectively. We're always referring patients to each other. Uh, and I know that all of the allied health professionals um, you know, talk uh, are a lot, a lot more joined up than, for instance, they are in the USA. So we have huge assets in this country as well as globally. The golden window of opportunity. What do I mean by that? So this is the life of a, someone who has the HD mutation. And at some point they'll get symptoms of HD which will inevitably worsen unless we do something about it. What we know from the animal models though is that the number of healthy neurons starts dropping before <coughs> the symptoms begin, sometimes decades before. But actually it's not that they're dying right from the outset. For many years the neurons are struggling, they're unwell and they're unhealthy, but they're not yet dying. And later on there's more in the way of neuronal death, but there, there are always neurons there that are struggling but not dead. And if that's the case, then that is something that can be rescued. Because we have the gene, we have the genetic <laughs> test, that allows us right now to study all of these people before they get symptoms and find out what's going on and develop treatments to try and help them. When, once we have treatments, this golden window becomes an opportunity to prevent, to treat while they are well, to prevent the onset of the disease. And if we can do that, then we can push back this symptom onset boundary. And if we do that far enough, then people will live long enough so that they can look forward to dying of something else, such as being run over by a bus, uh, the great British dream of being run over by a bus. <laughs> um, so that's what we're aiming for. And I think it will come in these small steps that we're talking about. So number four is having symptoms doesn't mean it's too late. Because the corollary of that slide would seem to be that you know, prevention is everything and the people who are already affected, it's too late for them. I don't think that that's the case. We'll only know once we have effective treatments. But from the mouse models, with, with, treated with things like gene silencing drugs, what we know is that if a mouse is born with an abnormal HD gene and is allowed to become sick, if you then switch the gene off, the mouse will improve. It didn't, the, the mice don't just stay unwell, they actually improve. And if you slice off their heads, well, that's not very good for them. But <laughs> if you look at the brains under a microscope, you find that the, the pathology in the brain is actually somewhat improved. So, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that there are neurons struggling that can be saved applies equally after the symptoms begin. So, finally then, for my big five, science is cumulative. What I mean by that is, and this is a slightly romantic notion, I like to think of science as being like a glacier. Americans, I have to say glacier. Uh, but I can say glacier, especially since I'm kind of in the north here. I can revert to my northern roots and say glacier. Um, my window's glacier than your window. Um, snow falls, little tiny snowflakes fall somewhere in a mountain, and nobody notices it, and no individual snowflake makes any difference. But over hundreds of years, the snowflakes get compacted and compressed into this enormous structure that literally carves its way through the living rock of the mountain. And that is, to my mind, how science works. I told you it was a bit, uh, I won't say poetic, pretentious. Um, sometimes it goes forwards and sometimes it goes backwards, but every day we know more than we knew the day before. And 24 hours a day, HD scientists are working to cure this disease. Hopefully these are messages that will, that, that will reach your patients via you. Okay, here comes the science bit. So, before I go on to my top three, uh, this is the galaxy in which we live, photographed from the outside. It's actually an artist's impression. <coughs> it contains 100,000 million, or 10 to the 11, stars, which is a lot. But if you multiply that by 100, you get the number of cells in the human body. I, I mention that because it's a lot of cells. Each and every cell, with a, one or two notable exceptions, which I won't question anybody about, has this basic structure, cytoplasm and a nucleus, GCSE biology. Everything that cells do, all of the clever stuff that cells do, the thing that makes a neuron a neuron uh, and a liver cell a liver cell, is all down to these machines called proteins. There are about 20,000 different proteins that every cell in our body is capable of making. Our DNA contains the recipe book for making each of these proteins. You could think of it as a recipe book with 20,000 pages or recipes. 
It's a very precious recipe book, and we don't want to get ketchup and garlic on it. So it is kept locked up in the nucleus. In order to make a protein, we make this working copy of the DNA, of the gene. And this is made from RNA, which is a single-stranded version of DNA. The message, like a photocopy of a recipe. That looks something like this. This is the DNA strand. This is the DNA, the little blue thing which I missed. It's the DNA copying equipment. It unzips the DNA. And out of it, it these, these little yellow blobs come in, and this string of RNA shoots out at the top. And this is happening millions of times every second in each of the billions and billions of cells in our bodies. Which is pretty cool. Well done, guys. Good work. <laughs> The next step is to make the protein, and this happens by joining together this string of amino acids. Each one is a building block, and they're joined together like beads on a string. They then fold up to make the protein, and that looks like this. So this is the yellow RNA strand now, and then the protein-making machinery, the ribosome, latches onto it. Extra bits of RNA carry in these little red blobs. You can just see the string of the protein emerging from the top. And three letters in our RNA these three little blobbles here, corresponds to one red amino acid, which is joined to the growing chain. The protein emerges, and then it folds up, and then it does stuff. And in the case of Huntington's disease, it's caused by what we call the Huntington gene. It always confuses me that it took so long to find the gene that causes Huntington's disease. If, if I was looking for it, this is where I would start. Start with the Huntington gene, right? It's obvious. Anyway, it took them ages, we don't know why. Uh, the Huntington RNA is the RNA that, we, that concerns us, and the protein is the Huntington protein. As I say, three letters in your gene, your DNA, corresponds to one amino acid building block. And so, for instance, TCC corresponds to serine, which we abbreviate with S. CAG corresponds to glutamine, which we abbreviate with Q, because G was already taken. The normal Huntington protein looks something like this. No one's ever seen it, so we don't know what exactly what it looks like. The mutant Huntington protein is different. It has a longer CAG, too many CAGs, and that causes a change in the rest of the protein. And if you're a protein, then changing your structure, your shape, will change the function. It changes your behavior. And in the case of Huntington's disease, that results in this public enemy number one. This thing that looks like a mountain is actually a, a, a nano, a, a nano, a, it's very small. <laughs> a very small blob of Huntington measured using a gadget called an atomic force microscope. Um, this is a Huntington aggregate. You may have heard of aggregates or little clumps of protein that form in our cells when we have the HD mutation. It's likely that these little sausages down here are probably the, more poisonous than the mountains. But the, this, is, this is the mutant Huntington protein, public enemy number one. <coughs> and this is what happens in our cells. This abnormal sticky protein that's supposed to be helping us actually starts messing up the machinery of our cells in many different ways. And those are the effects that we need to stop in order to treat Huntington's disease. So that's the problem that we're dealing with, a relatively straightforward problem. This mutant protein is knocking around and we need to do something about it or do something about the effects that it is producing. So my top three, and these change every time I give this talk based on what's happening and what, what I've heard and what, what, what has been published. But these are my top three at the moment. Number one is reducing production of the mutant protein through gene silencing. Number two is improving communication between neurons through PDE inhibition. And finally, reducing inflammatory damage, KMO inhibition. So back to, we'll start with gene silencing therapy. Hands up if you've heard of gene silencing therapy. It's pretty big news, and um, it's, if you ask 100 HD researchers what is the most promising uh, thing that's being worked on to try and treat Huntington's disease or, or prevent it, slow it down, that most of them will say gene silence. The idea is that basically you design a drug that sticks to the Huntington RNA. Um, these drugs are relatively easy to make, you just, you just have to stick them together in the right sequence. So it sticks to the RNA. The cell detects this, and it recognizes it as a signal to stop. So it's, the cell has got to stop producing the protein that comes from this RNA. And the protein isn't made. 
It's, it's literally that simple. It's not literally that simple. But the concept is that simple. It's a bit like if your house is flooding, you turn off the tap. Makes sense. This has been going on for about 10 years now in Huntington's <coughs> disease and has now been successful many different times through different formulations in mouse and now primate models of Huntington's disease. Or rather, in primates, the drugs have proven themselves to be safe and to get in the brain where they are needed to go. This year has been a big year for gene silencing. The, uh, a company called ISIS just finished a trial in motor neuron disease. Um, it was not intended to, or there was no expectation that it would slow down the disease because it was a safety trial, but it was, the, the drug was delivered into the spinal fluid of ALS patients and their heads didn't explode, which is very good news. So um, that was a successful safety trial. Um, and that will now go on to more trials, but it's pr a very important proof that the idea of delivering these drugs to the nervous system is safe. At the last count, 13 different groups across the world are working on gene silencing for Huntington's disease, of whom at least three are in negotiations with the FDA or with other regulatory agencies about starting their first human trials. And at the recent World Congress, a couple of months ago now, uh, it was announced that CHDI's, um, the, 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 the study that they're supporting, uh, is, in, is hopefully going to start treating patients in 2014, which is next year. So this is not five years, ten years, uh, you know, the plans are being made now, centres are being enrolled and uh, the, the protocol is being finalised. There are lots of HDBuzz articles on this because it's such big news. Um, so search HDBuzz for Gene Sciences. For me, the biggest news of the year was that Roche, drug giant Roche, had purchased from ISIS Pharmaceuticals the rights to their top drug candidate. This is the one that's supposed to be starting in 2014. They paid $32 million up front and have committed $360 million to bringing these drugs to humans, um, assuming that the safety trials uh, go well. There's an HD Buzz article on this, and this was my reaction when I heard that news, because uh, that's the most, by a long way, that any drug company has ever committed to Huntington's disease. And I think it represents a real, not only a real step forward in itself, but also a real seal of approval of how far we've come as a community in terms of developing these experimental treatments and sort of packaging them in a way that the drug companies want to spend big money on the trials. The um, caveat to these treatments is that none of them will be available orally or intravenously. So these will all need to be delivered into the nervous system, either by a lumbar puncture or through a pump into the lumbar CSF, or for some of them, a catheter into the brain. So this is serious stuff. This is not a walk in the park. But if it works, it will be, as I'm very fond of saying, like, so worth it. Um, <laughs> and it will be very expensive. So th but this is why we need these sort of specialist resources because this is, you know, you need really good neurosurgeons and really good clinical care in order to make these treatments uh, worth trying. So, next is PDE inhibition. What is that? Well, so we know that the neurons communicate electrically. Electrical signals whiz down our brain cells and that's how they communicate. But when one neuron wants to talk to another, there's a gap. And for the signal to cross the gap, the electrical message has to be converted into a chemical one. So, and then that chemical message triggers an electrical signal in the receiving neuron. So it looks something like this. The, mess, the signaling molecule comes in and then a cascade of signaling happens in the second cell. Now when that happens, loads of new stuff is generated, so the cell has to reset itself. And that's done by these enzymes called phosphodiesterase, or PDE enzymes. Can you tell what's going to happen? They clean up and recycle these uh, messaging molecules so that they can be sent back and then a new cascade can begin. Pfizer, drug giant Pfizer, of Viagra fame, now Viagra is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It's different from the one we're trying in hunting terms. But Pfizer knows PDE inhibitors. So they and a number of other companies are working on <coughs> inhibitors of PDE10, which is the one that seems to go wrong in Huntington's disease. These drugs improve symptoms and damage at the cell level in HD mice, and they've been tested in, in a number of different models now, and they seem to be doing exactly what we need them to do in all of these model systems. This year, Pfizer has made massive leaps forward, 
They completed a, a human imaging trial to demonstrate that the target is a valid one in humans. That's never been done before in HD. Previously, we would take a drug and throw it at the problem. When Pfizer does a trial, they say, well, let's make sure that, that the target is valid. So they're doing things in the right way. And last month, they started dosing HD patients in a phase 2A trial in Paris with their PDE 10. So these are Huntington's disease patients receiving this drug, which will hopefully relieve movement problems and cognitive symptoms of HD. And if we're lucky, it may also make a difference to the long-term future of those connections. There's a Buzz article about that if you want to find out more. So number three then, an area dear to my heart, is inflammation in the brain. So we think of brain cells, we think of the neurons, the, the, the electrical cells, right? Well, actually, those are only about 10% of the cells in the brain. Other cells called glia make up 90% of the cells in our brain. And these little green blobs are called microglia, and they are the uh, immune system of the brain, the uh, white blood cells of the brain. They produce a variety of chemicals that are designed to fight off uh, invading viruses and bacteria. So there's one called quin and one called kina. Quin is harmful to neurons, and kina is protective to neurons. So it's a simple tale of good versus evil. In the normal situation, there's more kina. So kina wins in the normal brain. In HD, quin wins, and that's bad, we think. KMO is an enzyme which decides on the balance between quin and kina. Kynurinin monooxygenase is its full name, but KMO to its friends. So if we can reduce the activity of KMO by inhibiting it with a drug, that should restore the healthy balance. And that is what is being tried. Um, a group led by Paul Machowski did an experiment in mice with a KMO inhibitor, <coughs> which seemed to work. CHDI has its own enhanced KMO inhibitor called CHDI246, <coughs> which they're testing now and they're pursuing to human uh, trials. This year, they announced that the drug produces in the spinal fluid precisely the kind of changes that we need to see in HD patients if these drugs are going to work. That's never been done before. Normally we would just throw the drug at the problem. But things are being done in the right way now. Uh, the uh, the uh, background work is being done before we go forward with the incredibly expensive clinical trials. So those trials are now being planned by CHD on <coughs> and working humans on this pathway is likely to begin very soon. The bottom line is, and those are only three, I normally talk about five, but there are at least a dozen top targets that are being pursued by CHDI and others at any time. I'm not paid by CHDI, by the way, just in case you're wondering. I just, I'm a big fan. Um, so the drug pipeline is full. We've been talking about drugs that are kind of here and that are near to human testing. But right back at the level of targets, every week we hear about new targets, and some of them make it through to the next stages. We haven't got any drugs here yet because of this thing called the Valley of Death which is a very romantically named concept that represents basically the problem of lots of things working in animals that don't work in humans. And as an HD patient told me once, all we need really is a drug that turns humans into mice and the problem is solved. <laughs> I don't know of anyone who's working on that. So this is the problem. We know lots about our mice. But we, oh, and I read Ted Humanus through the medium of Jedward here. <laughs> um, we know a bit about humans, but we don't have a lot that will help us to bridge the gap. So we have all of these drugs that work in mice, and none of them are capable of making the journey over into humans. So this is the valley of death. We can learn more about our mice, and that might make, that might make a difference. But what we really need to do is understand the humans a lot better. And then we'll have enough of a crossover that the drugs that work in mice will start working in the human. <coughs> what this means, and this has implications for everyone in this room as research evangelists, I think, which is, I think, the job that we should perform. <coughs> this is, these are the words of Robert Pacifici, who's the chief scientific officer of CHDI. The drugs are coming. To which I've often heard this reply. This was a message that came through to HD Buzz. I haven't altered it in any way. Let me know when they're testing the cure. There's that they word again. Um, what's wrong with this statement is two things. Firstly, no one will ever know in advance when we're testing the cure. You only know that 10 or 20 years after the first trial. And it's not just in testing the cure, it's in the observational research that will lead to what we eventually find out to be the cure. So we have to study people before we can test drugs. If people only volunteer for drug trials, 
then the drug trials won't happen for many years. So we have to get people involved in all of the research, not just the drug trials. Robert Pacifici continues, his advice to patients and families <coughs> is that they should enrol in every single study that they're eligible for because there is nothing more precious to a drug hunter than an observation that's made in the patients we want to treat. And that's a crucial message. So my message to HD families is that HD research needs you. And that's very real and it's, it's true right now. Registry is a very good example. It's going to be folded over into Enroll HD. This is not only a means of studying HD, it is also likely to be the big database from which patients for our drug trials are drawn. So people who wait for the drug trials to come along may well end up missing them. So I would encourage people to get involved in that, but also in any research, not just the big multinational trials, but also the, the 10 patient imaging pilot or the five patient new cognitive test pilot or the physiotherapy trial. Whatever you can get involved in, I encourage you to do it. I want, so those, that's my quick overview of what's happening and why it's absolutely crucial for us all to work together and for us to make it as easy as possible for all of our patients to take part in this work. Um, I visited <coughs> Washington DC earlier this year. This is the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And uh, I was with an HD family member who's also a supporter of HD Buzz. He took me to the Martin Luther King uh, Memorial, which has the shape of a mountain from which the block containing the statue is um, sort of pulled forward. And on the side of the block it says, out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. That is what HD research represents, a stone of hope. Um, and so I would encourage you to get your patients thinking along these lines um, and offer them as many small stones of hope as you can because uh, the sooner we can do that, the sooner we can all move forward towards treatments. Thank you for your attention.